Our next speaker is Constance Chu, and she's going to talk about impact of FIDA on registration results reporting and publication of neuropsychiatric clinical trials supporting FDA new drug approval. Hello, everyone. My name is Constance Zhu. I previously published under the name Xuan Yi Zhu. Uh, the reason I decided, one of the reasons I decided to change my name is to reduce the amount of time it takes for people to figure out how to address me in the emails. Um, I am a third year medical student at Yale School of Medicine. Uh, I would like to thank my co-authors. None of us have anything to disclose for this study. Um, our research is motivated by prior work that showed publication bias is a serious problem. About 25 to 50 percent of clinical trials were never published. Trials with positive results were shown to be two to five times more likely to publish than trials with negative results. A seminal paper published in 2008 by Turner, who I believe is here, um, showed how selective publication might impact the perceived efficacy of antidepressants approved between 1987 to 2004. Of the trials that were determined by the FDA as positive, they were all published. Of the trials that were determined by the FDA as negative, the majority was either not published or published in ways that encouraged positive interpretations. If you were to look at published evidence alone, Turner concluded that you would have an impression that nearly all antidepressant trials were positive, while in fact, half were not. The concern is that the results of many completed clinical trials were being swept under the rug and hidden from the public view. Many, including those of you who are sitting here and uh, Awen just did, propose that a possible solution is to require all trials to register and to report results on the public trial registry, which can provide a means to keep track of which trials are published and which are not. This is precisely what the U.S. Congress did. The Food and Drug and Administration Amendment Act was enacted on September 27, 2007, which I'll refer to from now on as FDA. FDA requires essentially all non-phase one clinical trials to, uh, reg involving FDA-regulated or approved medical products to register prior to study initiation and to report results on clinicaltrials.gov. It has been 10 years since the enactment of FADA and the publication of Turner's seminal paper on the selective publication of antidepressant trials. Our question is, has FADA resulted in fewer trials being swept under the rug? To answer this question, we chose a cohort of trials that we identified from the approval packages of FDA, um, of the approval packages of neuropsychiatric drugs, which is similar to the cohort used in Turner's paper. Our objective is to characterize the registration, results reporting, and publication for these trials before and after FDA. We excluded the drugs approved after 2014 to give the sponsors and investigators at least 24 months to report results and to publish their trials. Between the pre- and post fda groups, we compared the rates of registration, results reporting, and publication. In addition, just like what Turner did, we also compared the rates of publication FDA agreement, which is when both the FDA and the publication claim that the trial results are positive, questionable, or negative. Here are our results. Oh, sorry. Um, so, uh, among all the drugs approved between 2005 and 2014 by the FDA, we found 23 were approved to treat neurologic conditions, 14 for psychiatric conditions, which included three for substance use disorders. In the approval documents of these drugs, we identified the results of 100, 142 efficacy studies of which 101 were either initiated or completed prior to FDA enactment, and 41 were afterwards. Now is the results. 
Um, pre for that, 64% trials were registered, and only 10% report results. Post for that, 100% were registered, and 100% reported results. This suggests that FADA is associated with higher rates of registration and results reporting. Next are results on trial publication. Pre FADA, 90% trials were published, of which 93% were published in agreement with FDA. Post FADA, 100% were published, of which 98% were published in agreement with FDA. We provided the list and details of the publication with conclusions that directly contradict the FDA decisions in the slides using the QR code. Feel free to scan right now. As you can see, the differences of both outcomes were not significant. There does not seem to be an association between FDA and the overall publication rate and the overall rate of publication FDA agreement. Before we jump into a conclusion that FADA had no impact on the publication, publication of clinical trials, we decided to perform a subgroup analysis based on whether the FDA considered the trial results as positive, questionable, or negative. Here's what we found. FADA could not have had any impact on the publication of clinical trials. They were deemed by the FDA as positive. They were already 100% published in the pre-FADA period and remained so after FADA. We did observe the impact of FADA on the publication of trials deemed by the FDA as negative. Pre-FADA, eight out of 13 negative trials were not published. One negative trials were published as questionable and one as positive, both disagreeing with FDA. Only three out of the three pre-FADA negative trials were published as negative in agreement with FDA. In contrast, all five out of five post-FADA negative trials were published as negative in agreement with FDA. Although it appears that the sample size of the negative trials are small, but it does represent a significant improvement in terms of publication rate of negative trials. We did not show the data on qu trials with questionable results on this slide because there was only one such trial in the post for that period. Here is a summary of the conclusions that we drawn from this study. For that was associated with higher rates of registration and results reporting. But that was neither associated with the overall publication rate nor with overall FDA publication FDA agreement. However, our post hoc analysis suggests that FADA may be associated with higher publication rate of trials with negative results. There are a few limitations of our studies. We did not study other factors that could have influenced the registration, results reporting, and publication of clinical trials such as the ICMJE recommendations. We did not search for registration records in other trial registries. Our conclusions may not be generalizable to studies supporting other indications, other type of drugs, post-marketing studies, or studies not involving FDA-regulated medical interventions. That being said, a recently published paper involving trials supporting FDA approval of drugs treating cardiovascular disease and diabetes showed the very similar results. Our studies have important implications. It shows that policy like FADA can be effective to prevent clinical trials from being swept under the rug, which in turn prevent bias from affecting the practice of evidence-based medicine. However, FADA only applies to FDA-regulated medical products. Similar policy should be considered for other types of interventions to reduce bias in the literature of other types of, in the, also a part of the medical practice, um, such as behavioral, surgical, and health system interventions. Thank you. All right. I 
I guess I have to ask a question. Um, and I was thinking, of, because you're a medical student, I don't want to put you at too, uh, too much on the spot, but <laughs> how can you say FIDA had the impact when it's not possible to look at cause and effect using the study design? I'm, it could have been some external factor, right? I absolutely agree. So that keeps, him up, keeps me up at night. Um, <laughs> that being said, I, I, I come to appreciate the importance of attempting to study the possible cause that could reduce publication bias. Um, I think more study definitely need to evaluate my claim, our claims, um, but it's important to acknowledge the impact of FADA because it really is a significant step made towards um, transparency. And another thing that probably you're getting in epidemiology one um, is at least I was always taught not to do a subgroup analysis unless the initial analysis shows something, which it did not. So you led to a post hoc analysis that Presumably by that you mean it wasn't pre-specified. So are there other post hoc analyses that weren't done that might have shown something significant when your original analysis didn't? I'm just wondering again about the exploratory nature and what led you in that direction. Uh, I also completely agree. Um, so uh, I think that reflects um, our lack of, uh, lack of foresight, because we already observed 100 per nearly 100% publication rate in Turner's paper. So we should have thought that we're not studying a group of, uh, like we're not studying a homogeneous groups. Um, so uh, we also are very cautious what, uh, to conclude the impact on the negative trials. And we, I, I believe I use the term may suggest. It's not you I'm worried about, it's, the, it's how others will interpret uh, your results. Thank you. Any other questions? Don't be shy, or is it just postprandial tiredness? Thank you very much. Thank you.